All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for sharing your afternoon with us today. Uh, my name is Kaylee McCain. I'm the Central Coast Regional Coordinator for Civic Spark, a national service program of the Local Government Commission. This is the very first poster symposium session of our two week series celebrating the Civic Spark class of 2019 to 2020s. Uh, graduation and their accomplishments and best practices while serving local governments across California. Today's session is entitled Planting Seeds for Sustained Climate Action, and we're all really excited to get started and to hear from our fellows today. A few logistical details before we hear from our first presenter. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties today, um, please feel free to message Sarah Wong. She's our uh, co-facilitator and you can message her directly using the chat feature and she can help you troubleshoot any challenges you're having. Um, every fellow will have about five to six minutes to present their capstone posters today. Um, so the presentations will be fairly short but we'll have a few moments after each presentation for questions from the audience. Um, which you can either ask directly using the chat box feature or you can unmute yourself as well and ask your question directly. We'll let you know when it's time to do so. Um, we also encourage audience participation throughout this virtual event. So even if you don't have a question to ask of our fellows, please feel free to use the chat box, um, send in reactions if you hear something in the presentations that really stands out to you or that you're really excited about. Um, feel free to give kudos to the fellow during the session um, and just cheer everybody on throughout today. Um, so without further ado, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first presentation. Um, we'll start by hearing from uh, Meredith Anderson and Sam Ruderman um, based at the Sierra Nevada Alliance, followed by Christopher Flores with the City of Winters. Uh, so I'll go ahead and cue to your slide and you can go ahead and get started. Awesome. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Meredith Anderson. I'm really looking forward to sharing our project with you today and kicking off this virtual poster symposium. I am a senior Civic Spark fellow at the Sierra Nevada Alliance and the city of South Lake Tahoe here in the Sierra Nevada region. Um, all right. So for a brief overview, of the events that kind of led up to the development of the Climate Action Plan. Um, in 2017, the city of South Lake Tahoe passed a 100% renewable resolution, committing the city to a number of different renewable energy targets and emission reduction goals. So emission reduction goals include at least a 50% emissions reduction by 2030 and 80% by 2040. So these goals are more aggressive than the California statewide goals. And while they are feasible, um, immediate action is necessary to start on the path toward reducing emissions in our community. So with these emissions reduction targets established, it was important for the city to see where exactly these emissions were coming from. We then completed greenhouse gas emissions inventories for 2015 and 2018 to better inform emissions reduction strategies in the climate action plan. So natural gas, transportation, electricity are a few of the top emitters. So the draft strategies have focused heavily on reducing energy consumption and reducing the overall use of fossil fuels um, as energy sources. Sam will talk a little bit more about strategy development later um, and I'll be focusing more on the community engagement side of things. So our first form of public outreach was in the form of a public meeting in city council chambers. We planned and led this public kickoff meeting in December of 2019 to inform the South Lake Tahoe community of the Climate Action Plan development process and to ask for initial input on what the community would like to see in the CAP. We did outreach to community organizations, public agencies, and other stakeholders involved. We also spread the word on social media uh, and with flyers po posted throughout town. The meeting was the most well attended since cannabis businesses were approved to do business in town. So this definitely showed there was a lot of community support for this effort. During this meeting, city staff members spoke about projects the city had already started working on. The 100% Renewable Committee Chair spoke about the city's commitments to climate action. And the attendees were encouraged to share their thoughts and ideas they had for the CAP. 
So with everything going on with COVID, another in-person meeting was not in the cards to collect more public feedback. So we decided to go with an online survey instead uh, to distribute through the city's networks, uh, local media outlets through um, the form of a press release we tried to reach all community members this way, which was inherently difficult. <laughs> um, the survey allowed respondents to pick their favorite draft emissions reduction strategies from a list of potential options and then rank those based on importance or effectiveness. Um, this gave us a better idea overall of what was important to the community. So over the next year and beyond, fellows will focus on equitable equitable engagement uh, and targeted outreach to disadvantaged communities in the area for more robust feedback in the climate action planning process, in addition to CAP implementation. So for next steps, uh, we were able to collect public input and comments through this survey um, and prioritize strategies based on the feedback. These strategies will be added to the draft climate action plan document. Um, and then this, doc this document will be released for another round of public comment in mid August. So with that, I will hand it off to Sam to speak more specifically on the strategy development process. Thanks again. All right, hey everyone. Thanks Meredith. Again, my name is Sam Ruderman and I'm also a senior climate fellow at the Sierra Nevada Alliance. Thank you all for tuning in today. I see John Friedrich and Trish on the line. Thanks for tuning in guys. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing some more details of the process for developing emission reduction strategies for the city of South Lake Tahoe's first ever climate action plan. So there is going to be some overlap here with Meredith's presentation, but hopefully we can dive a little bit deeper into the process that we took to figure out what strategies we wanted to include in the city's climate action plan. So as Meredith mentioned, the initial step in any climate action planning process is to conduct a greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Without this, the city or any other jurisdiction won't really know where the bulk of their emissions are coming from. And so this information is really pivotal to developing effective policy. So that's what we did last year. And after completing an inventory and gaining an understanding of the emissions generating sources in the city, the first step for us to develop local reduction strategies was actually to review a suite of climate action plans from other similar communities. So a few examples of the towns and cities that we looked at were Aspen, Colorado, Whitefish, Montana, Canmore, Alberta, and Truckee, California. And if you're unfamiliar with the, these places, they're pretty similar to uh, the city of South Lake Tahoe. Truckee, California is actually um, just north of South Lake on the north shore of Lake Tahoe. And it's, they're also going through their own climate action planning process right now. And we were able to participate in the development meetings for their plan, which was super beneficial for our project. Not only were we able to gain hands-on experience with the town of Truckee and their staff and consultants, but like I said, Truckee is also a very similar community to South Lake and is located in the same geographic region. So reviewing these plans gave us ideas and examples of what might be able to work in our community. But like Meredith mentioned, we also held the public kickoff meeting back in December of 2019, which was really helpful in terms of getting an idea of the community's priorities and getting ideas for what they wanted to see in the plan. We used the feedback from this meeting and the other caps that we looked at, as well as some other more technical emission reduction resources to craft our own initial list of strategies. So we ended up with about 120 strategies that the city could implement, and we then presented those to city staff. So quick sidebar, during this process as this all is going on, we were able to convince the city to allocate some additional funds to hire a consultant to help us with more of the technical components of the climate action plan and provide some expertise, such as on strategy development. So as this is going on, we're learning, this is where the very long multi-iteration process begins. We learned very quickly, there's a lot of back and forth uh, throughout the strategy development process. So basically what this looked like was the city took our initial list of strategies, reviewed them and then provided comments and feedback. And then after a couple of meetings and a few more emails, we revised the list and the language down to a point where everyone was pretty, pretty comfortable and pretty happy. The next step was to send these strategies to all of the relevant stakeholder agencies that we identified as being involved in the strategies. So we ended up sending these documents and uh, the draft list to 11 agencies in the region. So a few of these include the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, Liberty Utilities, Southwest Gas, and the California Tahoe Conservancy, just to name a few of them. And we received really helpful feedback from all 11 agencies and then integrated their suggestions and their feedback into the draft strategies list. And then once again, we sent them back to them after we'd done that to get another round of approval. So now we're at a point where the city and the stakeholder agencies and the consultants and Meredith and I were all pretty happy with the list that we have. Um, but we know that we need to slim down this list. So to figure out where we should be making changes, 
this was when we created and uh, released the public survey to gain some more insight from the community on what we had developed. We did have to do a first round of condensing so that there was not too many strategies in the public survey. So we went from a list of over 100 uh, down to around 75. And this to me was actually one of the hardest tasks of this entire project. But we got it done and ultimately we released the survey with about 75 strategies, as I mentioned, for public comment. And we got 200-ish responses, the vast majority of which were really beneficial for our uh, planning process. And this step really was crucial because now we had the information, again, what the community really wanted to see and what they valued, which we could use to help slim down the list even further, which we did. We cut it down by half even after the 75. And that's pretty much where we're at now. Um, so we have what I like to call a rough final draft of strategies, and we're right in the thick of finishing the actual document. So I wish I could have included the list that we developed um, as part of the presentation. Um, like Meredith mentioned, they largely focus on transportation. So there are a lot surrounding EVs and improving public transit in the region. And then the second largest category is improving buildings energy use and energy efficiency. Again, largely around retrofitting old homes and moving towards electrification. Like Meredith mentioned, we have this presentation scheduled for July 28th to present to city council and the public on the rough final draft of the cap. Um, and getting into some next steps, we're actually, we've completed some of these since I made this slide. But basically where we're at is we'll be finalizing all of the emission reduction calculations. So trying to figure out how many emissions will actually be reduced by these strategies and then analyzing the costs and other co-benefits, trying to figure out what we might implement and when. And then we're gonna be soliciting another round of input when we uh, have that city council meeting and after that through the release of an actual draft cap document. And then we'll be incorporating that final feedback into the plan and getting it ready for adoption. So some of that will happen after we're out of Civic Spark, but that's uh, the timeline now. So Meredith and I have been at this for two years now. And to be honest, we're pretty stoked on all the work that we've done. So in the past couple of years, we've completed four greenhouse gas emissions inventories. We had 120 attendees at our community workshop. We received over 200 responses to our public survey. And after 22 months, we're soon going to have one comprehensive climate action plan all done. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed our presentation. Awesome, thank you, Sam and Meredith. That's um, so much that you two have done in the last two years and um, just congratulation hats off to you all for being um, in the final the final stretch of things. Um, so we'll take a moment to pause to see if there are any questions from the audience. You can feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question um, or we can read them off from the chat box if you'd prefer to type them in. I have a question for you guys. Um, hi, my name is Erin. Um, I work for the town of Truckee um, and I participated in those sessions that Sam and Meredith were talking about. And I was just curious, um, since Truckee was undergoing a really similar process, we ended up with a lot of strategies that were controversial or were directly opposing one another. And I was just curious to see, since you guys had um, so much community input, how you dealt with that. I'll take it. <laughs> um, so yeah, like Sam said, we all, the majority of the response we got from the feedback was helpful. Um, and similar to Truckee, um, natural gas is definitely a hot button issue. Um, so we kind of, we had a big matrix of kind of how we um, went over strategy, pr like prioritizing strategies. Um, and we took kind of what our favorites were um, and kind of made that list first, then compared it with what the community wanted um, and see kind of where everything fell um, and then prioritize based on that. But it was interesting that um, natural gas was a lot less popular than, or natural gas um, limiting strategies were a lot less popular than we would have hoped. <laughs>
Awesome. Well, hearing no further questions, I'll go ahead and move on to our next presentation. Um, but thank you so much to everyone who sent in uh, congratulations and notes to Sam and Meredith in the chat box. And um, please encourage you all to continue to do that as we um, hear from each fellow during this session. Um, and at the end, we'll likely have a, a bit of time for more questions. So if anything else does come up at the end, um, we can cover it then. So we'll go ahead and move into uh, Christopher Flores with the City of Winters. Go ahead and take it away, Chris. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, as Kaylee mentioned, I'm Christopher Flores. I'm here with the City of Winters. I'm their current Civic Spark Climate uh, Fellow for the 2019-2020 service year. Um, today, I'm going to delve into three main components of my project that I worked on for this service year. Um, and those three components that I'm going to focus on have to do with updating the current draft climate action plan in the city and um, incorporating the textual and legislative uh, components that needed to be brought on board with that, um, as well as uh, forming a community-based action group to advise development of the document. And then finally, incorporate new data that was um, a result of a 2016 baseline year greenhouse gas inventory. Um, but before I delve into each one of those three topics, I'm gonna give a quick brief history lesson of where climate action planning has been in winters the past few years. So in 2012, the city received a draft climate action plan from the UC Davis uh, Sustainable Design Academy. And from that uh, draft climate action plan, um, several revisions were being made, but was never officially adopted. Um, so now we're here in 2019, 2020, and the city did not have an official document still. So uh, that's where my role came in with this project. Sorry if I'm popping and yelling into the mic. Um, anyways, so that's where my role came in with this project, um, working with uh, the city to try to get to a final useful end product. Um, and so in that same time span of seven and eight years, moving forward, several new pieces of California legislation passed like SB 32, SB 379, um, new policies or existing poli policies were enacted or renewed. Uh, so incorporating all these new pieces into the document was one component of my project. At the same time, when all these uh, textual updates and content updates to the CAP document were necessary, uh, it brought an, uh, an open an opportunity for more community engagement. For example, the residents that were not, uh, not around in winters um, in 2012, um, that are here now in 2020, that's, it's a different makeup and different community and different needs are brought forward and, and are uh, community now. So it brought it an opportunity to engage a new current population in winters. And so the form that that took, uh, in the way that that took shape in that sense is that I formed a community-based um, commission or board. This in particular is a climate action plan development board, and it served as a space for uh, public meeting and public comment on and uh, public input into the document. And then lastly, over here on the right, you'll notice um, some of the data that I incorporated from a greenhouse gas inventory performed by Ascent Environmental. Um, using that data, I was able to develop some projections for the city moving forward so that we can quantify what measures it's, it's using to achieve its uh, new reduction targets that I was able to form. Next slide, please, Kaylee. All right, so delving into forming a community-based action group, um, when I started this project back in early 2019, uh, a lot of questions came up and you know they, they didn't quite appear all at the same time. It's as you were moving through things, new questions came up. So you know I started off, you know who is gonna be involved with this um, board, this committee, this commission, whatever it might be, um, what is more, most suitable for the current you know, city kind of climate and how people feel about you know, issues within the city, not just climate, but in general. Um, how long should people be engaged in this process? Is it gonna be something that someone's gonna sign up for five years? Is it gonna be something a group of people are gonna sign up, sign up for you know, as needed? Um, so all these questions came to, came to focus in mind when I was trying to develop this uh, group. And one that is, you'll probably hear and echoed several times throughout these sessions today is, how do you plan for that kind of uh, newfound engagement, especially starting a new group in a virtual sense, in a virtual capacity? Uh, what I ended up doing in working with city staff and decision makers here in Winters 
So we formed a six um, six member board that uh, was composed of residents that were appointed by the city council. But these residents uh, were making their comments and suggestions in public meetings where other people that were not uh, appointed members could also attend and offer their input and feedback as well. Next slide, please, Kaylee. All right, and then lastly, I wanted to discuss here some of the other content included in the document. So as I mentioned, not only during this revision process, it brought in that opportunity for more community engagement, but uh, much needed uh, improvement to the city's existing document. So over here on the left, you see the 67,748 figure there. That is the new baseline that came out with this information. Um, I was able to cascade that downwards over on the table to the right to determine a new uh, greenhouse gas reduction target for the city to con consider uh, moving forward. And that incorporates different factors like population growth, um, you know, California mandates like the RPS renewable por portfolio standard and different uh, factors playing into that figure. Next slide. All right, and so moving forward, um, this the board is completing its service term right now. They were working for six months to work on this planning component of the document. After there are, they are completed, they're gonna take their identified implementation tasks and present them to the city council. So the city council can help determine and form a longer standing uh, climate action commission to work on the deliverables identified in the CAP document. Um, and then those will be re revisit, revisited and reevaluated back in, in 2023. So, um, but that's all I have for you today. So if you have any questions, feel free to give me an email and I'd be happy to reach out or answer any questions you might have right now. Awesome. Great job, Chris. Lots of uh, great congratulations coming through the chat box as well. Um, any questions or congratulations for Chris? If anybody wants to unmute yourselves and, uh, and share. All right, well, we'll go ahead and move on to our next presentation, um, which is Michelle Gelden. Go ahead and take it away, Michelle. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, as Kaylee mentioned, um, my name is Michelle Gelden, and I uh, did my service here with the County of Santa Barbara, and I primarily worked on helping the Sustainability Division uh, create greenhouse gas inventories for the entire county, for the eight individual city jurisdictions within the county, and we also created one um, unincorporated community greenhouse gas inventory, which I highlighted um, and I'm going to talk about shortly. But I um, also was able to work on uh, supporting the development and involvement of the Santa Barbara County Regional Climate Collaborative, um, and there are a lot of collaboratives within California. Uh, they're all members of an organization called ARCA. Um, we created a new one that has recently come online and is available now to um, more than just governments. Uh, it was initially just starting out and now we have fully implemented it um, and it's gaining some traction. And the general premise of it is to uh, have a forum for multi multi-sector, um, collaboration to discuss regional solutions to adapting to and mitigating uh, climate issues um, at a larger scale. Um, but I'm going to get back to that. So I'm going to jump to the inventory work. So we um, 
were able to work with a really cool organization called Cool Block, which was a grassroots organization that is helping to um, create um, awareness and education for uh, specific households. And they went into one of our communities within Santa Barbara County called Isla Vista, which is around a 23,000-ish um, community of mostly students that's adjacent to a university, um, UC Santa Barbara. So um, normally unincorporated communities don't really get their own inventory. They're usually wrapped into a county, but we wanted to give them one to help with the momentum going on with that program and to also help with their very ambitious goal to um, have Isla Vista be carbon neutral by 2025. So um, we were able to do that using a lot of modeling um, because unfortunately with unofficial inventories, there's um, kind of a limitation in data you can get from utilities and from um, different places. So a lot of modeling went on um, and it's kind of, um, it parallels a lot of other inventories where transportation and building use energy are um, the highest um, emission sources. But um, whereas greenhouse gas inventories are kind of an individualized snapshot of emissions and emission sources in the county, um, I was also able to work on, as I mentioned, uh, the Regional Climate Collaborative, which was a more um, regional aspect and it um, kind of reflects more of the dynamic nature of trying to address climate issues. Uh, so it's really interesting seeing the importance of having data for um, individual jurisdictions so that they're able to um, address and see what they are um, producing and um, what pertains to them specifically. But it's, as we know, very important to have um, a dialogue going in a larger sense because no one jurisdiction can uh, combat or mitigate climate change on their own. Um, it takes a lot of uh, collaboration and transparency in order to not have redundancy and to um, not do something that might negatively impact your neighbor um, and things like that. So um, both of those uh, projects that I worked on this year kind of went hand in hand in trying to create um, data and also the dynamics of people working together at a larger level. Um, and these are both in preparation for the county's updated climate action plan that is going to um, address our new goal of reducing our emissions to 50% below 2007 levels of emissions by 2030. So it'll be very important to continue the work we're doing collaborating at a larger level and trying to get all the voices involved. Um, and then just some lessons learned that um, have been highlight highlighted to me this year. Um, include the importance of having consistent and standardized greenhouse gas inventories. Um, a lot of the inventory, or a lot, excuse me, a lot of the um, jurisdictions within our uh, county haven't even had inventories done for them. And um, having a metric and a baseline that's consistent, and now we can look towards the future and consistently giving them inventories to see how they progress is really important for them. Um, and for us to see how we're doing. Um, and also having it standardized is also a really important way that we can compare and know that we are um, measuring in the right way. So that has proved very important. And um, I'll also mention um, the importance of community engagement, not only um, at the collaborative level, but um, identifying the need for more than just higher up organizations, but also um, more individual communities and um, vulnerable pop populations that might not be involved in the conversation being really important to um, also putting into our efforts as we try and look forward to creating our new climate action plan. Um, so that's pretty much all I have. And um, thank you for listening. And I would be glad to have um, any questions. Can I ask a question? Kaylee, this is Kiff. Hey, I thought I'd do it unmute style. 
Um, thanks, Michelle, that was great. I'm curious, given the complexity of doing a sub community scale inventory that you did in Isla Vista, but also the opportunity to use it as an engagement tool. I don't know, just thoughts about that, the, the effort required potentially, but against the mobilizing opportunity that it represents for that sub community group. Sorry, could you mention that last part? So start. just, you know, it's a tool for engagement potentially because you've got a focus group and a focus neighborhood, but it's also a lot of extra work and clearly many of the communities in Santa Barbara haven't even done their inventory at a whole community scale. So I'm just curious if you have thoughts about using an inventory as a mobilizing tool for a focus group like that. Yeah, I think it's really important because I think a lot of people, especially when you're like dealing with the public, it's important to understand your contribution. Um, more tangibly um, and what I have in the poster that I presented doesn't have the breakdown but we were able to show that um, residential versus commercial the residential there's a uh, much more emissions associated we can have the breakdown of per capita emissions and we're also able to identify that even though um, it's a community that's really well known for um, having really good active transportation modes it's actually the largest portion of its emissions still comes from um, transportation. So um, I think it is a really good tool for um, providing awareness at that baseline level so that people are able to see where they contribute specifically and that makes them want to attach to the cool block program that we were working with more um, to um, engage more and see what they can do to reduce their own emissions. Thank you for that question. Awesome, and then I also see we got a question through the chat box um, from Alexandra Hutchinger. I'm so sorry if I pronounced your last name incorrect, um, but they said, hi, Michelle, what is Cali VIP? Thanks. Yeah, so I put that on there. That is um, an example of another type of policy that is kind of enacted at a regional scale, which is um, something that's done only through regional collaboration. Um, it's a, um, I'm not going to completely right, but it's uh, trying to um, get regions to come together so that they can um, apply for funding to get um, infrastructure and funds for electric vehicles in their communities. and. Um, that the process of applying for it requires um, communities coming together and planning um, and creating the application together. Um, so that is best done when everyone is on the same page. And um, we, as the county, um, have been doing that with uh, neighboring um, counties, uh, including Slow County. So that um, was just another example of how we have been able to um, facilitate the different people in our community to um, gather and m work on something together. <laughs> I, yeah. Thank you. Awesome, thank you and congratulations, Michelle. All right, so we'll move along thank you. to Sandra. Hi everybody, um, so my name is Sandra, Sandra Brizzo, and I served as the Climate Fellow with the San Francisco Department of the Environment. And one of my main projects of the fellowship was conducting San Francisco's 2018 greenhouse gas inventory. So I'm gonna run through this inventory process, the findings and the implications with you all. So just to give you some background, San Francisco, Department of the Environment, conducts a community-wide and municipal greenhouse gas inventory for the year prior, since that's when we have the most comprehensive data. So because I began my service project in 2019, I completed the 2018 emissions inventory. So the municipal emissions inventory is a more specific look at the energy use, fuel use, um, emissions in general, stemming from just the municipal sector, we get a pretty drilled down analysis of the municipal sector's emissions. Then the community-wide inventory, which um, the graphs that I put on reflect, 
That includes all the emissions from sources located within San Francisco's city and county boundary. And that's kind of where we get a lot of our good old information from. So we break up the community-wide inventory into sectors in compliance with GPC protocol. GPC stands for the Global Protocol for Community Scale Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventories. Um, and those sectors are the transportation sector, buildings, landfill organics, municipal, agricultural, and wastewater. So why do we take this GPC compliance sector-based approach? Well, we're required by chapter nine of the environmental code to track our emissions. Um, and it's what we've historically done. So similar to what Michelle was saying about the importance of having this consistency in inventory methodology, it's easy if we stay consistent with this CVP approach to compare previous and future years inventories and track our actions and emissions over time. We also report this particular disclosure to CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Pro Project, the Global Covenant of Mayors, and C40 Cities, since those organizations San Francisco is a member of. Um, and again, it enables us to compare ourselves to other cities, not just ourselves over time, but other cities that are using this framework. So the process, so beginning in September, um, and basically until January, um, I collected and processed processed activity data into the municipal and community-wide databases that we have. Um, and since we've been conducting this inventory for years over time, um, we have a long checklist of contacts that we reach out to for activity data. Um, and examples of what activity data is, is it could be energy use from PG&E and Clean Power SF, which is San Francisco's CCA. Um, it could be fuel use from the variety of public transit organizations, um, vehicle miles travel data, wastewater data, et cetera. We also have a data processing methodology um, that we've continued to build upon and optimize for more efficient processing, taking that activity data and getting out emissions of carbon dioxide um, equivalent. So, then January to April, I, after completing this inventory and having Excel sheets galore filled with data, I took that information and I prepared presentations and reports, um, including a presentation to the senior staff of the San Francisco Department of the Environment, um, a climate fact sheet, and our at a glance report, which summarizes the findings of the inventory. And we also, we published that in that report on our website and we also published the data to our San Francisco open data portal. So the good old findings. So in 2018, San Francisco was responsible for 5.14 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, our emission. Um, transportation, as you can see in that pie chart, was the largest chunk, uh, took up 45% of the emissions, um, but buildings were a close second constituting 44% of the emissions. And as you can see in that little breakdown, natural gas was actually the majority of those building emissions, um, which presents evidence and a good case for why building electrification can really reduce um, cities' emissions. So from 2017 to 2018, emissions actually flatlined a bit. Um, and we. The data shows that this could be due to increased natural gas use um, in the building sector. And overall, San Francisco has reduced carbon emissions 35.4% since 1990, while population has increased 22% and GDP has increased 172%. So we're still reducing a lot of emissions given this boom that we've been experiencing. Um, so next steps, what do we do with this inventory? Well, we use the information to inform our 2020 Climate Action Plan update, which we're calling San Francisco Forward. Um, tracking the status of a city's emissions is crucial to developing strategies and actions aimed at further reducing the emissions. 
Since San Francisco plans to run on 100% renewable electricity by 2030 and 100% renewable energy by 2050, it's important to know where we're at in our emissions and where those are coming from to be able to develop effective strategies. Um, and then finally, we report this emissions information, including, or in addition to a lot of other climate data, to the Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP, um, which is an organization that rates cities and all rates San Francisco on our climate efforts in general. So these past couple months, I've been reporting that information. So that's it about our inventory. Um, happy to answer any questions about it, um, but yeah. That's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sandra. We'll go ahead and um, pause for a moment to see if anyone has any questions. Again, feel free to unmute yourself or feel free to send those in through the chat box. All right, well, hearing none, we'll go ahead and keep everything moving along. Again, if you have any questions for Sandra that do come up later, um, or for anybody who uh, gave a presentation today, feel free to send those in through the chat box and we'll likely have some time to open it up again at the end. So we're gonna head a little bit inland now from San Francisco and I'll go ahead and mute myself. Hello, everybody. My name is Lorenzo Simon and I've been the Civic Spark Fellow with the City of Antioch uh, for the past 10, 11 months. And I'm just gonna talk a bit about my major project, which was developing a climate action and resilience plan for the city, and then talk a little bit about one way we've tried to facilitate sustained climate action um, in the city. I'll just give a little bit of background on Antioch and resilience needs in the city. So currently over 48% of Antioch residents are considered to be lower income and over 50% of Antioch residents um, are people of color. And at the same time, Antioch has high rates of asthma, um, high temperatures being as far inland as it is, despite still technically being in the Bay Area, um, and substantial flood risks, uh, especially in Northern Antioch, um, which is where a lot of uh, low-income communities live. Uh, at the same time, there's a distinct lack of capacity in the local government um, of the city. So Antioch has some of the lowest levels of um, staff to population ratio in the state. Um, Antioch is also a bit removed from the kind of consensus in the, well, in most of the Bay Area at least, that environmental justice and climate change are major issues. Um, and to kind of hammer that home, um, Antioch has one person working full time on environmental initiatives um, other than the Civic Spark Fellow, um, despite the city having over 100,000 residents. So in considering like how to work through these issues um, to promote sustained and equitable climate action. Um, we kind of made a partnership between the environmental department and the housing department and um, linked those two together to fund the actions laid out in the Climate Action and Resilience Plan with CDBG funding. Um, for those who don't know what CDBG is, it's the Community Development Block Grant Program. It's administered by um, HUD housing and urban development at the federal level. And it essentially funds a large variety of projects um, in low income communities. So we've linked the Climate Action and Resilience Plan with CDBG funding in order to kind of get a um, 
consistent stream of funding uh, for climate resilience in the city. And this approach also requires a focus on equity throughout the process because the major source of funding um, for the actions laid out directly um, is directly contributed toward low income communities. And that's obviously assuming that the whole thing is administered properly. So to get just a little bit more detailed, um, we align specifically the climate action and resilience plan with the five year consolidated plan, which is the document needed for CDBG funding eligibility. And both of those plans were um, approved by city council in May, uh, allowing us to move forward in the process. Um, so far, we've been able to get approval for funding for a couple projects, including um, an expansion of access to cooling and clean air centers in Northern Antioch through the HVAC upgrade at Antioch Library and um, job training and professional development uh, for Antioch youth in uh, the energy efficiency space. Unfortunately, that program had a couple of setbacks with the COVID virus, um, but we're still excited to move forward with um, those things and also with everything that can come through the pipeline for the next five years uh, as we kind of better understand um, community needs and community priorities uh, in Antioch. So I'll just leave everyone with this. If you are in a city that is eligible for CDBG funding um, and you, know, you work on environmental initiatives, climate resilience and things of that nature, it could be an effective um, approach to partner with whoever operates the CDBG um, program um, in your city because we have found that it can be uh, an effective way to generate you know, sustained uh, and equitable climate resilience planning and implementation um, in cities. So thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Awesome. Thank you, Lorenzo. Um, I'll give folks one more moment to shoot in that question to the chat box um, or unmute yourself. And um, if not, we'll go ahead and move on to the next session. But wanted to give folks one more moment. Awesome. I'm also seeing a, a link to the website if you want to read the CARP as well and check it out. Thank you for sending that in, Julie. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and move on to the next presentation now. Thank you, Lorenzo. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Great. Uh, thank you, Kaylee. Thanks, everyone. Happy to be here and see in person, kind of, uh, what all of the fellows have been working on. Um, I'm Sam Bowman, a Civic Spark Fellow serving the Community and Economic Development Department at the City of Walnut Creek. I'm going to talk to you today about my support of Walnut Creek's new Sustainability Action Plan. Um, and then just as an aside, I did narrow the focus of my presentation today uh, from what you see on the poster. So some elements that you see there won't be covered in my speech, but I'll give you some more info on the new Sustainability Action Plan. Um, so prior to um, CED's partnership with the, C the uh, Civic Spark program, the City Council had set an update of the existing 2012 Climate Action Plan as um, one of four 
council priorities for 2019 through 2020. Um, the existing cap had set a goal of reducing community emissions 15% below 2005 levels by 2020, just to give you some background. Um, and the uh, council's main goals for the cap update were to continue setting targets for, for even deeper greenhouse gas reductions over the coming decade, uh, as well as to address new sustainability topics like um, adaptation, resilience, and equity. Um, so I was onboarded to a role that was primarily focused on helping with the implementation of the initial phase, um, the community and stakeholder engagement phase of what was later rebranded as the Sustainability Action Plan. Uh, so the project's timeline covers three phases. Um, I just mentioned phase one, uh, and that's going from fall, last fall to uh, this summer. And then phase two is policy and strategy development. That's uh, from summer to fall of this year. And then phase three will kick off in the winter and that will be plan preparation and environmental review. Um, and then hopefully adoption by the city council. So uh, throughout the service year, I joined the uh, project leads, um, sustainability coordinator and housing analyst, Kara Bautista Rao, and the project consultants Placeworks um, on bi-weekly check-ins uh, just to collect and track data and also to just keep planning um, steps in our outreach phase. Uh, last fall, I um, laid the groundwork for, for some online engagement by helping with the update of the city's former Going Green Together webpage to the um, rebranded ECO or ECO or Enjoy Cleaner Options. Um, so that's been a platform for continued online engagement as the project has moved forward. And then while I was doing that, I was also helping with uh, public outreach at several community events last fall, um, both to inform community members about progress on the existing cap, as well as to let them know about opportunities for um, shaping new goals for the new uh, sustainability action plan. Um, around the same time in fall, I joined city staff on the informal uh, sustainability team to participate in the project kickoff, which was facilitated by the, the project consultants Placeworks. So um, we were led in a visioning exercise and we drafted a vision statement for an environmentally sustainable Walnut Creek in 2030. And then um, in the following weeks, uh, the sustainability team uh, finalized the list of stakeholders um, to address during this outreach phase. Um, and then to help prepare for uh, engagement and outreach, um, starting in the winter uh, of last year, I assisted with the uh, community inventory and a municipal operations inventory focused on calendar year 2017. Um, this was to help benchmark progress made towards the initial cap goals. And, and we have recently found out that there was great progress. We actually, the city exceeded its goal. Um, the, the goal was a 15% reduction from 2005 levels by 2020, and it's actually on track to be about 27%. Um, some of the data that I helped collect for the community inventory included PACE energy retrofits, um, public EV charging stations, water consumption, wastewater, and permitted rooftop solar PV. Um, and the, the, the uh, city staff collected data on um, things like building electrification and zero net energy buildings, um, land use and green infrastructure, community opt out rates for MCE, automobile and public transportation and active transportation and, and many other things. And then for municipal operations inventory, we collected data on planned construction and demolition for uh, 2030 through 2050, as well as um, building energy use, employee commutes, uh, the uh, city government vehicle fleet and, and other items. And so starting in February, um, the sustainability coordinator and project consultants presented these findings and the draft vision statement to city council, which then approved the stakeholder list and the engagement plan. And then um, I also helped present the projects to the city youth commission and I led the youth commissioners on a similar visioning exercise and we continued um, drafting that vision statement, which is intended to be a living document as the project goes forward. Um, plans for our stakeholder outreach and community outreach were of course 
uh, place on hold due to the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, initially, we had planned to do a community workshop in April, but that was postponed to uh, July. It's going to actually be on July 29th. We're really excited. Um, and as of right now, I'm helping spread public awareness about the upcoming workshop. Um, so I drafted a press release for City Channels and I've posted some advertisements on uh, various community news sites. Also, um, given that the senior population is a relatively high percentage uh, compared to other communities in Walnut Creek, it's about a third of Walnut Creek's population, I'm working with the Senior Center on um, ensuring that there is equitable access and that um, that um, everyone's able to participate in the community workshop. Um, and so next steps for the project will be phase two later this summer and then into the fall. So that's again, um, the policy and strategy development phase. And then in winter, um, we'll, the city will go forward with uh, plan preparation and environmental review. And um, as my fellowship wraps up, I'm really excited to help with the final steps of this first phase. I think it's really nicely timed. Um, and I really look forward to seeing uh, what the community comes up with for its, uh, its future sustainability goals. Uh, thanks very much for your time. I would be happy to take any questions. Hi, I just see um, Kip's question in the chat box. So um, right now, um, the, the, the goals are pretty general. It's more in a, in a visioning phase right now. Um, th there aren't any specific goals. So those, those will be drafted as the community kind of has a chance to review the, um, the, the, the results from the community and municipal operations inventories. And, um, and also as stakeholders um, are engaged in this process. So actually recently we um, met with the planning commission and also a list of environmental groups in the city and they've had a chance to kind of like just talk about generally where they would like to see the city go. Um, so it's really kind of in an amorphous stage right now and it's just taking shape. Um, but I think, um, uh, you know, I guess the, the biggest challenge will be to, to, to come up with aggressive targets that, that will help the state meet its goals uh, to, to reach uh, zero energy. And um, I guess just make sure that everyone, uh, another challenge is just making sure that everyone feels like they're part of the process and engaged and is invested in, in, uh, in going forward with it. And I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. Hi Sam, um, I have a question as well. Um, great job with your presentation and congratulations. Um, I was curious if you could speak more about your partnership with the Senior Center and uh, give us more details as to what equitable virtual outreach looks like with that population. Yeah, thanks Vanessa. Um, so right now, basically I'm just um, working with someone at the Senior Center to, to um, attached language to existing outreach. So there are some print newsletters uh, as well as online communications that go out to members of the community who typically like go in person to the senior center. If you know it's a place, it's a, like a community facility for people to engage in various activities and you know um, just be active in the community. Um, I, I don't know actually to what extent that that community is still like actively engaged in the online realm right now because I don't really often work with the senior center. Um, and so um, I think that's actually, this is another answer to Kim's question. This, this is a really big challenge is just making sure that, that, um, that everyone is part of the process. But um, um, yeah, I, I basically am just trying to make sure that 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 information gets out there and also that that there's a um, that you know we we know if 
if there's any um, level of discomfort with engaging on Zoom, which is the platform that the workshop will take place over. Um, and, if, and if that's the case, then we'll just have a phone number for people to call in. Awesome, wonderful work, Sam. Um, any other questions before we uh, move on? All right, well, we'll go ahead and head down the uh, coast of California now to our next presen presentation. Thanks, Kaylee. Hi, everyone, my name is Marina. Um, I served in the city of San Luis Obispo this year with Shannon, and we worked on a bunch of different stuff, but the bulk of our year was spent supporting the city's climate action plan. So when we started the service year, a lot of the technical work and foundations of the climate action plan had already been completed. So for example, last year's fellows had hosted events to get input on what the community wanted to see. Greenhouse gas inventories were complete. Um, our supervisor had already had meetings with people from different departments to brainstorm feasible actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So most of the first half of our year was spent doing community outreach and communications on the climate action plan um, to keep the community involved and continue to collect feedback. So I'm going to do a super high level overview of three events that Shannon and I planned and hosted and then um, Shannon's going to talk a little bit more about the actual climate action plan document. And if anyone wants more information on these events or like the materials that we created for them, especially if you're staying for a second year and doing outreach, um, feel free to reach out to us. Our emails are on the last slide. Um, so you can go to the next slide. The biggest event that Shannon and I hosted was the CAP workshop and open house back in December. So we had over 70 people show up to this, which was pretty big for the little town of SLO. And what we did for this was we had poster boards all around the room. So I included the green buildings one as an example. Um, and we gave everyone green stickers and red stickers. And on each board were a list of the actions that we were thinking of including in the climate action plan to reduce emissions. And we asked people to put green stickers next to actions that they were excited about and red stickers next to actions that they wanted to learn more about. So this really helped us understand and better guide our communications efforts on where we were doing a good job communicating and where we needed to do a better job showing people how these actions can improve um, life in San Luis Obispo. And then we also had sticky notes for people to just leave general comments and feedback. Um, you can go to the next slide. And then community collaboration for climate action. This was an event that we hosted that was really just us facilitating a space for community organization leaders to meet and connect and collaborate on climate action. And this stemmed from the idea that we as a city government are uniquely capable of certain actions and community partners are needed for the rest. So when we first started doing outreach at the beginning of the service year, we were way too focused on education and like teaching people why climate action is so important right now. Um, but we realized that there's tons of nonprofits throughout SLO doing that same exact work. And there are different things that like only us as a city government can do. And so we want to focus on less things and focus on doing those things really well. Um, and so we hosted this space to bring together, we emailed like nonprofit leaders, different business owners in downtown SLO. Um, and we broke people up into groups based on those categories. So I think it was nonprofits, businesses, community service organizations and public agencies. And then we had people brainstorm ideas for how they can take climate action within their organization. So whether it was reducing greenhouse gas emissions or reducing water consumption or reducing their waste, um, this was really just a place for community leaders interested in climate action to meet each other, form connections, um, and brainstorm ways that they can help support each other. So that was the first of a series that is going to continue into the next service year, service year and hopefully beyond. Um, and we had like 25 people come to that, I think. You can go to the next slide. And then this last event was really fun. This um, informed volume one of our climate action plan that Shannon will talk about. 
Um, so a short story collection was really about getting people to connect with the climate action plan and think about how the actions in it will affect their lives. So we tabled at different locations throughout the city and we did this exercise at different community meetings. But the exercise had three parts. Um, we asked people to look over the actions included in the climate action plan. So when we tabled, we had like little laminated sheets describing the different actions in the plan. And then after reviewing them, start with exercise one on the left here. So imagine the years 2035, um, the place where I live has blank. To get from my home to my job, I blank. Um, in 2020, blank was an issue in my community. Now that has changed because blank. So we really wanted people to engage with the actions in the plan and relate them to their personal lives. And then exercise two and three included um, moments of just silent reflection and then imagining a specific moment in your life, whether or not it was related to climate action didn't matter. Um, and we asked people to write short stories and then we use these to inform volume one of the climate action plan. And so we use that worksheet on the left when we were actually hosting meetings and we could guide people through the activity in person. And then we use the little worksheet in blue on the bottom right when we were tabling, um, just under the assumption that like no one wants to stop doing their groceries to write for 15 minutes. And yeah, I'll pass it on to Shannon to talk about the actual climate action plan document. Hi, my name is Shannon. And I'm also a climate fellow with the city of San Luis Obispo, and I'm going to talk about how the city of SLO grounded local climate action through storytelling. I'm going to start with kind of a higher level overview of the climate action plan. Um, so in 2018, the city of San Luis Obispo City Council unanimously directed staff to pursue one of the most ambitious climate action goals in the United States of community carbon neutrality by 2035. So this would go on to be a guiding goal of the development of the 2020 Climate Action Plan, which now in its final form is called the Climate Action Plan for Community Recovery. Um, so the plan is composed of six decarbonization pillars that are listed on my poster um, that represent the different sectors that the city is targeting for emissions reductions. So these pillars um, are lead by example, which focuses on municipal operations and organizational leadership. Uh, clean energy systems, green buildings, connected community, which focuses on active and low carbon transportation, circular economy, which focuses on waste and green waste, and natural solutions, which focuses on the city's open spaces and carbon sequestration. Um, each of the pillars has their own uh, emissions reductions goals that helps contribute to the broader carbon neutrality goal. And then within each of the pillars, there's a total of 27 foundational actions that the city is planning to initiate and implement between the adoption of this plan and 2023, when the next climate action plan will be adopted. Um, so when the team was developing the plan, we did not wanna go with just the traditional strategy of creating a 100 plus page document full of complicated technical information and inaccessible language because that creates a real barrier between the work that the city is doing and the public who uh, is not only interested in learning more, but should be informed and who will be directly impacted by the actions that the city is taking. So we decided to create uh, what we consider a companion document to our traditional climate action plan, um, specifically for uh, public consumption, which would be uh, visually engaging, inspirational, creative, and allow for a deep understanding of the public to learn about how the actions that are being taken are directly going to improve quality of life in San Luis Obispo. So volume one, Stories from 2035, is a roughly 20 page document that is composed of six stories told from the perspective of different residents and community members in the year 2035, when the city will have implemented these foundational actions and future actions that are to be included in future plans and community carbon neutrality is achieved. Um, we really wanted to tell the story of climate action through the lens of the community so that readers could identify with what's in the plan, they could see themselves in the possibilities of a green and sustainable future, and that they could feel a sense of pride and ownership over local climate action. And as Marina explained, we facilitated a variety of outreach uh, activities and events to uh, inspire participants and gather ideas and sample stories to inform the creation of the stories that ended up in the plan. Um, next slide, please. 
So the public review draft climate action plan, uh, including volume one, is available now on the city's website through July 22nd for public review and input. So this is the cover page of the document. Right now it features um, snippets from different photo shoots from each of the stories, but for the final plan, we're going to settle on one photo. Next slide, please. And then this is a sample layout. This is the third story in the document. And so you can kind of see the general layout is a large title, the stories on the left, and then the foundational actions that are mentioned in the story are on the bottom right. And so to give you an idea of the process of how we developed this, we really wanted to show faces of actual real community members. So our team coordinated and I shot each of the photos in the plan um, with some support from friends as well. And so these guys that are pictured in this, uh, they are the founders and chief executives of a local startup called NeoCharge. They create adapters for at-home electric vehicle charging. And so we sat down and talked with them and got some ideas and inputs for what they hope to see in the future out of their company and out of our community. And we were able to write this story. And so you can see uh, that in the story, there are different phrases and words that are highlighted and numbered. So those are gonna represent the real life outcomes that can be directly connected to foundational actions in this climate action plan. So for example, in the first sentence, you can see number one, um, you know, the office is hustling on Monday, I barely have time to dock my bike. And so you can read that, directly connect that with connected community, uh, the first action, and then you can read about what the action is and see where you can read more details in the, uh, the more fleshed out document, which is volume two, technical foundations and work program. So yeah, that's about it. And if you have any questions, Raina and I would be happy to answer them. Awesome, awesome work, Shannon and Marina. Um, I'll give folks another couple of moments to feel free to send in your questions through the chat box or unmute yourself. Um, and thank you again, Shannon and Marina, for that great presentation. Awesome. So we had a question come in um, from Brian, who was a Civic Spark Fellow last year and also served in a spike in public web traffic to take a look at the document. Um, I believe he means since the uh, public draft was released. We actually have not uh, gotten any like analytics from the city's website, but we did release in companion with the public review draft and open city hall, which is um, a survey tool that we use with the city of slow. So we released a survey and we've seen a lot of engagement with that survey so far since the release. So definitely have a lot of eyes on it, which is exciting. All right, so hearing no further questions, um, thank you again, Shannon and Marina. We'll go ahead and move on to our last presentation of today. We're gonna go back up to the same part of California we started in. Awesome, thanks, Kaylee. And thank you all for attending this session. And thank you to all my fellow Civic Spark fellows. Uh, hearing your work has been incredibly inspiring. Um, so it's been really awesome. Uh, my name's Erin. I'm an Opportunity Access Fellow. I work for the town of Truckee up in Tahoe. Half the time, I'm with the Solid Waste and Recycling Division, known as Keep Truckee Green, and the other half of my time is spent with the Planning Division. And today, I'm going to talk about a very specific project I worked on with the Planning Division, and that's our Climate Action Plan. And I really wanted to highlight this today because of the very unique community-forward vision that Truckee had for this plan. So a little background, in 2017, the town of Truckee committed to 100% renewable goals. So this includes 100% renewable energy by 2050 
and an 80% reduction in carbon emissions to 2008 levels by 2040. So these are pretty ambitious goals. Um, and what it's really cool the town of Truckee does to tackle any objective, they abide by these principles called the Truckee Way. And I kid you not, people go by these principles for every project we undertake. Um, and in these principles, there's a huge emphasis on transparency and community engagement. Um, so that's the lens through which we um, approach this. Another really interesting thing is that we are incorporating our climate action plan into our general plan. So we're currently uh, going through our general plan update. So we have a general plan advisory committee um, and to tackle climate, we created a general plan advisory subcommittee uh, with 20 people, which is which was just as big as the general plan advisory committee. Um, and th this committee was made up of 20 community members um, throughout town, all with differing expertise um, and it included people like our natural gas provider, students, council members, and also people like Sam and Meredith. Um, so as you can see on this uh, timeline, we had some initial meetings, mostly focused on background, getting everyone up to speed, um, we had people meet our consultants, Ascent Environmental, and then we had four meetings specifically on uh, transportation, land use, energy, and waste. So for each of these meetings, people would come and propose strategies that they thought should be implemented in Truckee, um, what they would like to see. And it was my responsibility to take all of these strategies and turn them into actual policies, beef them up a bit, research what other cities are doing and see what could work for Truckee, as well as conveying to staff all of the climate friendly policies that we already had. So we made sure that we weren't duplicating our efforts. So after this last subject meeting, we had a community workshop where 60 people attended and we also released a survey. Um, and every single proposal suggested by um, residents, they were all recorded. And it was my job to synthesize these again um, and integrate all of them into our working policy documents. So every single one was considered, um, which was pretty impressive. Um, and after we had all these together, I actually created a tracking mechanism um, to make sure that we were truly considering each one. And so even now with all of our policies, we can we can check out our policy and then see exactly where that piece of input came from. And most all of them are from our community members. So after our workshop, we had an incredibly long list of strategies because we just kept them all together. We didn't, um, we didn't exclude any. Um, and like I was mentioning earlier, there were several strategies that were conflicting. Um, some were proposing one thing and others were proposing something that was in direct opposition. So we worked really closely with our advisory committee to have those hard conversations and make compromises um, to create strategies that could act actually be implementable for Truckee, but would still meet our carbon reduction goals. So we had our advisory committee do that, and then we had them prioritize all the strategies. So actually eliminate and come up with a really solid list of strategies that could work for Truckee. So that was nine meetings with our advisory committee. Everyone stayed super engaged. The last one was in February. So ever since then, uh, my supervisor, Nick Martin and I, We've been going through, continuing to consolidate, synthesize all these strategies, and now we have our final list of strategies um, that are actually now policies and actions. And so we've been integrating those into our general plan, and now we're waiting on Ascent Environmental to do a technical review, and then we, we will report those back to our advisory committee for our 10th and final meeting in August. Um, and since our climate action plan is going to be a part of our general plan, they'll all undergo a sequel analysis, which hopefully will be done in the next year. But what I think is really special about this um, and, and very notable was that tr truly all of our policies are from community members. And yes, we've added in research-based solutions and we've, um, we've beefed them up a lot, but the core of each policy is something that has come from our community members. Um, even people who have um, completely opposing views on the subject, but we've been able to work together and integrate them into something that will actually work. And because of this process and um, everyone we included, we were able to create really key relationships with some of our major um, emission reducing, reducing actors like our local utility district and natural gas provider. Um, so even though it was very time intensive, I think because of our intense community process, we're going to have a plan that uh, will be much more implementable um, 
and will actually happen because it um, truly encompasses uh, our stakeholders' perspectives. And that's it for me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin, and congratulations again on being in the home stretch of your project. Um, really, for everyone who presented today, the amount of work and effort and energy that went into all of the different efforts you were working on is just um, inspiring, at the very least. That's, uh, the, for lack of a better word, inspiring. Um, any, I'm going to pause for just one more moment for any questions for Erin. And if not, um, we'll go ahead and, and move along. All right, any questions or comments for any of our fellow presenters today? All right. Well, thank you to everyone who um, shot in your questions through the chat box. Um, and yes, thank you, Kif, for some final remarks there. Um, yeah, like I was saying earlier, it's really inspiring to hear all of the work that you've been up to and the amazing service that you've provided to local governments across California for almost the last 11 months. Um, and thank you for everyone for being here uh, to support and encourage our fellows. Um, this concludes today's poster symposium, the first of a two week journey. Um, please continue to support our fellows throughout the next two weeks by attending more poster symposium sessions. Tomorrow we'll pick up where we left off with a session called uh, Big Picture Adaptation, where we'll cover, uh, we'll hear from fellows who have been uh, serving state agencies as well as regional entities um, for to work on local adaptation solutions. Um, if you'd like to uh, register for those, Sarah is posting the links into the chat box right now. So please feel free to check out um, those websites. We also have our fellow page linked in the chat box as well. So if you'd like to get in contact with any of the fellows today, their email addresses are posted on our website. Um, let's see. One more uh, reminder, uh, recording of these sessions will be available after these two weeks. So if you missed out on a presentation you wanted to hear from, um, we will be providing that to all attendees. And finally, you'll notice on our screen, we have our graduation celebration coming up on July 30th at 1 p.m. Um, we'd love to have you return again to support and encourage our fellows as they uh, finish their year of service with CivicSpark. Um, we also have an interactive GIS-based dashboard coming out soon, hopefully within the next couple of days. So keep your eyes peeled for that. It will have a, an interactive way of seeing where fellows were placed this year, as well as seeing their posters that they presented on today. So stay tuned. And thank you again for spending some time with us this afternoon. I hope you all have a great week.